Lee. And on behalf of the Guardians Associations, the Cultural Awareness Series Committee, and our President, Brother Robert Rivers, can lecture in our Cultural Awareness Series. At this time, I'd like each of you to turn and greet the brother and sister next to you in the spirit of Emoja and in honor of our ancestors. At this time, I'd like to acknowledge all of you for your coming out this evening. It is your presence that continues to make this lecture series possible. Thank you for all coming out. I'd like, you to read, I'd like to read the objectives of the Cultural Awareness Committee. The Cultural Awareness Series is the brainchild and result of several meetings and communication between a group of African American men and women. A group of men and women who believe that our strength and future lies in the ability to gather, analyze, and digest information. Once doing so, Transforming this information into actions will ensure our survival as a people. We believe that it is knowing our history and who we are culturally as a people will be the true determiners of our destiny. The Cultural Awareness Series will devote itself to strengthening and empowering our families and communities through institutionalizing educational and cultural programming. We believe that while we address issues of concern in the workplace as police officers and civilian employees of the New York City Police Department, in order that we be more effective, we must respond to the educational, cultural, and spiritual needs of our members, families, and community. It is, on through, it is only through our ongoing efforts to reach out to our workplace and our communities at large will unity and constructive change take place. I'd like now to uh, turn the mic over to Brother Tariq Alexander. Tap sisters and brothers, welcome to our cultural lecture number two. Before I begin the program for this evening, we must take the time to give honor to our ancestors and to our elders for whose footsteps we tread and whose honor and ideas we must fly. I would also like to take a moment to give recognition to the brothers and sisters who have done their share to help make it possible for us to bring this endeavor to you. That's the members of the African Cultural Society, of the Guardians Association, and you here, in, in pre, uh, here present today. It takes a lot of time and effort to be able to bring these lectures to you. However, if we enhance the knowledge of just one person, it's worth it. So let that person be you. Remember, let each one teach one and the job of unification through knowledge will be accomplished. It is crucial that we learn our past history as it is the key to the door of the future. An understanding of Africa's role in shaping the civilization could possibly serve to reshape the African-American youth being cast off as a lost generation today. It now gives me great honor an immeasurable joy to prepare you for the learning experience of yourself as an African descendant that can be used as a key to unlock your mental door of who you are and from what you come. Dr. John Henry Clark is our guest speaker for this evening. Our elder, our scholar, and a multi-genius. And I ask that you help me by standing and giving a round of applause for our scholar, Dr. John Henry Clark. Thank you very much. I'm pleased with the invitation. We have a lot of work to do, and we want to go directly to the work. I have often said, history is a clock that people use to tell their political and cultural time of day. 
It is also a compass that people use to find themselves on the map of human geography. The role of history is to tell a people where they have been and what they have been, where they are and what they are. But most important, the role of history properly learned tells the people where they still must go and what they still must be. Something has happened to us that we pay little attention to and we are forever knocking at the door of other people barring cultures, barring ways of life inferior to the ones we lost. When you see the strongest thing about a people, look on the flip side and you'll see the weakest. The strongest thing about African people in relationship to other people was their ability to be hospitable to strangers. The weakest thing about African people is that they did not understand the intention of those strangers. And those strangers disrupted our society from Western Asia for 3,000 years before the Europeans. We are always adopting people and following after people who don't know where they are going. And we are always equating ourselves with other people, not knowing that it is not a matter of being better or worse, it is a matter of being different. Now I have such for the definition of African people in the history of the world most of my life, starting with my such in the Bible and with my great-grandmother, who I love as a deity, even to the point if faith was kind enough ever to show me the true face of God and it turned out to be Grandmother Mary, all I'm going to do is to shrug my shoulders and say, Grandma, of all the tricks you prayed, played on me, this is the greatest. I suspected that you was God all along. <laughs> what we fail to do is to see greatness and godliness in ourselves because we have been programmed into someone else's incubator. When you are born into one cultural incubator with a special kind of cultural chemistry that goes with your makeup, your personality, and your surroundings, and when you are taken out of that and placed into another cultural incubator, alien to your culture, you take on traits you never had before. Some time ago, some meat-clad women, all perfumed down and jewelry down, middle class and up, whatever that is, asked me to speak on the historical origins of black teenage pregnancy. They expected me to come and hang the black man out to dry condemn him down through the ages, and I didn't even mention him because there was no black e teenage pregnancy in Africa. There was no wife beaters in Africa. There was no men referring to women by the B word in Africa. Then where then did we pick up these traits if it didn't come out of our original incubator we picked it up in the second incubator because the condition in the second incubator 
influenced our makeup. We became things most unlike ourselves. Now, my mental notes for this lecture is called Law and Order in African Societies Before and After Invasion and Slavery. And I'm pulling on the fact that I have traveled in nearly every country in Africa except South Africa. And I have lived among people, so-called primitives, who were the most civilized people I have ever met because at first they recognized my humanity. When you live among people you've never seen before, when they make you welcome, fix special foods for you because they think you came from an alien land. They have to fix something American for you. And when they fix oatmeal for you, the, one of the few foods I didn't eat growing up, and I grew up poor, <laughs> and you eat every bit of it out of courtesy, you know that here is a people of warmth and kindness and the interesting thing about this encounter is that I was in the hinterlands between Ghana and Togo, and I was with a man of the Ewe culture group. I don't use the word tribe because everybody in the world came out of a tribe. French is a tribe, English is a tribe. But when you use the word tribe toward us, you use it derogatory. So I just don't use it at all. When you use it for everybody, I use it for us. Now, the interesting thing is that they had put me up in their home, and the wife was kidding the husband because he was a clerk in one of the local Barclay banks. And she said that every time when you married me, you promised to teach me to read. She spoke better English than he, and she did not know how to read. And she said, every time you promise me you're going to teach me how to read, you get me pregnant again. No more babies until you keep your promise. She wrote me back a year later and said, that she had given birth to a child, she had learned how to read, and she had actually written the letter she had written, she had uh, sent to me. And I remember the humanity of that meeting showed me how Africans behaved among Africans before Europeans came. And this is what we have lost. How then did we behave among each other before this interference and we began to imitate other people's manners, other people's clothes, other people's food, and sometimes, tragically, other people's women? At what point did we become dissatisfied with the people at home because in that second incubator, you lost the original values of the first incubator. I wondered a lot about this change. And one day in Ghana, I was visiting the superintendent of prisons in Kumase, the capital, the major, the cultural capital of Ghana. And I heard of what I would consider a minor crime barely worth a long conversation. Three men were working on a job. One man faked an illness, and the other man finished his work and gave him his share of the money. On the way home, they saw him in a bar 
drinking it up with the ladies. That was not only a violation of law, it was a violation of something in Africa that is stronger than law, custom. You want to know how then did we control each other before the Europeans came, before the Arabs came, and before those other Middle Eastern thieves came to take over our country. We controlled each other through custom that was larger and stronger than law. The family itself was a small contained nation. The uncle was equal to the father in dispensing discipline. Everybody belonged to something. And there was no idleness because everybody had an assignment. And all girls after a certain age had a husband. And if she didn't get one automatically on her own wits and charms, the old ladies and the uncles chose one for her. This might seem unromantic to you, but at least she got one. Do you have one? <laughs> the society furnished everything. <laughs> that you needed. The society was a mini state in itself. And then some foreign fool and faker had to come along and create the I love you marriage. <laughs> and love sometimes lasts a season. <laughs> But the, the I respect you marriage kept on lasting, and there was no word for divorce in their vocabulary. When you married a lady, you didn't just marry her. You married her family. And you brought together not just two people. You brought together goats and cattle and chicken and all those things came together by butcher of the marriage. And the uncles related. And you did not tell a lady the things we tell, tell ladies now because we did not understand that in African society, the matrilineal was created. The concept that the lineage comes down through the female side. And the king's son cannot be king, but the king's sister's son could be king. Therefore, eliminating any fight between family or within the family. Now, back to this case in Kumase of the three men. Because I was living in the home of the superintendent of prisons, he attended the trial when they took this man to his head chief. The trial lasted three nights. And I wondered how the man had apologized. That wasn't enough. He said he'd give the money back. That wasn't enough. And the trial kept going on. And he kept bringing in witnesses and witnesses. Then finally, near the end of the trial, in an African court, in the customary court, the accused can examine everybody in the court, including the judge. And the case is not over until the accused has called his last witness. The accused calls his, called his last witness his wife. And remember now, if she don't vindicate you, you are guilty as hell. <laughs> 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 she, 
She appealed to the court. She said that he's a generous man. He liked to think of himself as being rich. So he's always setting up the ladies. But he always brings enough food and clothes, money home for the family. He don't forget that, you know. He knows he can spend only so much, then he's got to bring the rest home. So he is, uh, his eyes are weak now. He has been reduced to a child. His mouth is bitter. He has not spoken the truth. He would like forgiveness. But the men said that they would forgive him. But the wife said, that is not enough. You must not only forgive him, but you have to agree to work with him again. Because if those two men fail to work with him, he is dishonored. And other men will not work with him. And when they agree to work with him, He shook their hand and hugged them both and thanked them. Then the wife thanked the court for restoring his honor. What was at stake? I went back to Accra to the home of Ghana's great lawyer, J.P. Donkwa, who had trained in Kruma. He was then in the opposition. And I asked him, what was the trial about? And Dunkwa, a typical school teacher, says, John, you're acting like a Western fool. Don't talk to me like a white man. You should know what the trial was about. <laughs> so he sent me down into his library, said, read this, read that. Maybe you'll find out. Finally, I read a little pamphlet he wrote called Honor and Obligation in a Can Society. When I came up, his, his wife was fixing dinner. He was holding up the dinner for me to find the answer. I said, Dr. Donquo, before the coming of the Europeans, African society was held together by honor and obligation. He said, you got it right now. At last, you got the answer. We'll have our dinner now. What I'm, why I've emphasized this is that we do not look for enough at ourselves. We do not look back far enough. We created societies that had no word for jail because no one had ever gone to one. We created these societies that were so competent, crime and punishment such as existed was taken care of within the structure of the family. And the family was not only a miniature industry, but a miniature nation. And nobody had to go on welfare because no one ever heard of welfare. The family took care of those in need. Each family took care of its own. We had created these kind of societies that had every element that went into the making of socialism and communism, every element that went into the making of Christianity before the first European wore a shoe or lived in a house that had a window. I am emphasizing this because you have been so brainwashed in years away from home and lacking knowledge in your own culture, you think you simply cannot make it unless you depend on Europeans or follow after them when they don't know where they are going. Every society. Every great idea, every humane idea that they ever touch is corrupted. They have proven that they are totally incapable of understanding or practicing democracy, Christianity, 
are looking humanely at other people as equals to themselves because they are so insecure they have to pretend that they are better than other people. <laughs> When we look back into our historical memory far enough, we will understand that over half of human history was over before anyone knew that a European was in the world. But how then did you control yourself? Honor and obligation. If I belong to group Y, I said that I will dishonor myself if I do something that reflects bad on group Y. Honor and obligation controlled me, and custom was stronger than law. There are certain things we do not do because we are not that kind of a people. No prostitution, no word for prostitution. Now you let people where rule over you and influence you where prostitution is a major industry in every one of their countries unknown to us before we came in contact with them. And you act as though you cannot make it into the world unless you follow their Christianity, which is synthetic, their democracy, which is a fraud, their philosophy, which is a lie. Because you have not looked deep enough into your own history, read the in-depth books concerning your history and how you behave one to the other before this interference. This interference came first from Western Asia, now mistakenly called the Middle East. Let's look briefly at Africa before this interference. Let's look at Nile Valley civilization Let's look at the development of that great river civilization, the first great river civilization of the world before the development of the Indus Valley, before the development of the Tigris and the Euphrates. Now let's look at the craving to claim Egypt as belonging, belonging to someone other than African people. Egypt is a composite nation made of many nations and cultures all coming from the south. The Nile Valley stretches 4,000 miles into Africa. Now, if you say the Europeans built the pyramids, you got to give me a timeline on the pyramids. There was no Europeans at the time. There was no place on earth called Europe at the time. He was emerging from the Ice Age. So let's use some logic. Would he go come from under the ice in Europe, come all the way to Africa, build a great civilization, go back to Europe, get under the ice and stay 2,000 years before he built a shoe for himself or a house with a window. The Asians didn't do it because African civilization hadn't spread into Asia to awaken them you find it difficult to look at yourself as the mother and fathers of what people call civilization. The first social order, the first organized religion, the first stone temple, 
You let your children come home and say, mathematics is hard. Look, boy, I'll spank your behind if I hear you say it again. We invented mathematics. If it's hard for you, it must have been harder from the, for the Africans who put up the pyramids. And the pyramids are still standing. They, they must have done a good job. They worked it out. It's hard for you to look at yourself alone in the world, uninfluenced by foreigners, working out the first laws that would govern man working out the philosophy and the social thought that will ultimately go into the making of an anthology called the Bible. They would take your teachings and they would call it their own. And they would take African animal stories and personify it with using human beings and you think they've got something original. These are African stories retold. The story of the Exodus was an African story 3,000 years before the Jews touched foot in Africa. Now I've used the wrong word. There was no such thing as the Jews in that time in history. The word Jew is not a Western Asian origin. It is not an ancient word. It is a word of European origin. And the people of the Hebrew faith during that period of time were just Western Asians converted to the Hebrew faith. And there's one thing you have to consider and think about. When they came into Africa as visitors escaping famines, they had no clear religion they had no clear language. They had no clear culture. When they left, they had all three. So what is the origin of the people you now refer to as Jews? What is their cultural origin? What is their religious origin? And do these Western Asian people relate to the Europeans who adopted the faith belatedly and was eventually called, referred to as Jews. Now, I'm dealing with the interference with Africa's golden age. I said that Africa has had three golden ages and they could have a fourth one if we got ourselves together and believe in ourselves because all the ingredients out of which it can be made is either in our hands or could be in our hands if we just believed in ourselves well enough to know we were the first people to build a state, the first people to build an institution, the first people to lay out laws that would not only govern us but eventually govern all mankind. Now, let's go back to the copying that went into the making of the Bible. I know the Bible is sacred to you. It's supposed to be all true. You believe in the Adam and Eve story and all the story about the ark. These things are precious to your mind, but these are stories taken from us and retold. Now I'll tell you just one, the origin of the Exodus story. There was, an Afri there was a pharaoh one day who got a little despondent and during those days all pharaohs had magicians. There's a two volume work on it, the role of magic in the creation of religions. The real story of religions are beautiful. These stories are beautiful. Very educational, but you ain't gonna read it because it's gonna debunk all the nonsense you think you know about religion. But well, this pharaoh and his magician got together and the magician said he thought he would take him for a ride down the Nile in a rowboat. And to make things more pleasant, all the rowers were good-looking girls. 
So the lead girl stopped the boat and started crying. And the pharaoh asked, what is wrong? And so the magician went up to see what was wrong. She said she lost her bracelet. She leaned over too far, she dropped her bracelet. And the pharaoh said, now you take care of this. So the magician went and parted the water, reached out on dry land, picked up the bracelet, gave it to her, her necklace, and she now smiling, the water coming back, and they rolled down the Nile. That's the origin of the Exodus story. Somebody else tells it about six, it was 600,000 people crossing, running from a pharaoh. <laughs> now, the fact that the pharaoh they were running from has a, has a mummy in Cairo Museum right now, prove they did. If they drowned him, they rescued him. <laughs> Another thing about the story, escaping the Pharaoh's army, you couldn't have escaped the Pharaoh's army because he controlled both sides of the river. He had armies on both sides. All right, you drain a river of water. You've got a deep gorge, deep muddy gorge. 600,000 people without the loss of a chicken or a cow. You gonna believe this? Come on, give me a break. <laughs> you believe other people's retelling of your story but you won't believe the real story. And the other part of the story is that these were the first visitors to Africa. And after the visitors came, the conquerors came, the first conquerors, 1675. And these visitors joined the conquerors and became clerks and collaborators with the conquerors, forgetting the Africans who had befriended them, gave them homes, gave them food, and because the African is a perfect host, saw some of them without women, gave them women. We are so kind. Now look at our strong point and how other people took advantage of it and reduced us to servitude because we were kind enough to open the door without asking whether he was a thief and a murderer. We are still giving thieves and murderers the benefit of the doubt while we distrust each other. Now, during this period of the foreign kings, they produce the world's first wheeler dealer politician, Joseph, called the provider. Why could he provide? He had the ear of the foreign kings. Then a king arose who knew not Joseph. Who is this king who knew not Joseph? The African kings coming back to power. And owed the Jewish people and Joseph no favors. Now the African would say, those who wish to obey African law can stay. The rest of you will have to go. Those in the so-called exodus were those who decided to go. They had gained many things in Africa, including the leadership of a mythological African called Moses, who was escaping from the Pharaoh's wrath because he had murdered one of the Pharaoh's messengers. And he had to put some space between him and the Pharaoh. So he agreed to lead them out. Now if you look at the story of Moses coming to the promised land, why did he get to the edge of the promised land and was turned back? 
because he wasn't one of them. Now you see an early show of Hebrew nationalism. You don't know where to leave people out. You let, every, they're human just like us. Let them in. Yeah. <laughs> They'll let you in to do you in. <laughs> when the sons and daughters of Ireland call a meeting, they don't want no non-Irish. <laughs> when the Hebrews call a meeting, a special meeting, they don't want no non-Hebrews. And if you do it, they, they, you call a racist, a separatist. But well, do it anyway. You better do it. We are the only people who get condemned for loving ourselves and taking pride in ourselves. Now, after this period, this first interference, you have to look at what had happened. These foreigners had interfered with African customs. They had bastardized African women. They had begun to produce a generation of people who wasn't African and wasn't Asian, didn't know who they wanted to be loyal to. We have not dealt with bastardization as a factor in history and a dangerous factor in history because when you're in between, you don't know who to be loyal to. And in a real revolution, who kills you depends on who sees you first because neither side trusts you. That's a cold fact of history. Now, Africa's recovered from this period, the end of the first golden age, to go on to have another golden age lasting a thousand years. Now the conquerors came back the Assyrians, now called Syrians. The Iranians, then called Persians. And they were so bad, they opened the door for a young Greek with a gender problem called Alexander the so-called Great. <laughs> this was the first European occupation of any part of Africa, followed by the Romans, another bunch of well-dressed thugs. <laughs> they killed people for being Christians, and Christianity got so influential, they stopped killing Christians and became Christians politically. Became Christians because it was to their convenience and the person who proclaimed it, Constantine, was a degenerate. A bunch of religious people called the Essence propositioned him and told him, if you're going to follow this new religion, you got to give up some of your degenerate ways. Women hanging around in the palace, naked, he's fornicating all over the place. He said he'd give that up. He could do that in private, so. <laughs> and they told him that he had to give up eating red meat. Then he lost his temper. So keep your religion. <laughs> Go help him. And finally, they said, that, while we are vegetarians, we'll let you have your meat. And so a compromise was made. He proclaimed Christianity to be the official religion of the Holy Roman Empire. By 600, the Romans had disgraced themselves in the mismanagement of the faith and had destroyed the many Africans in the faith, had declared war on the early African Christians to the point where a camel boy began to grumble and ask for reform. Failing to get reform, he asked for a new religion. Now this might hurt a whole lot of people's feelings, but Islam came into being so fast, it is the least original 
and the least imaginative of all of the world's religions. They stole a little bit from Zoroastrianism, a little bit from Judaism, a little bit from old Christianity. They put it together so fast, there is no truly great Islamic literature. And the Quran is a composite that a whole lot of people talk about and don't read. But the Africans, thinking that the Arabs would help to get the Romans off of their back, were right. The Arabs helped to get the Romans off their back and replace the Romans on their back. And the Arabs are still on their back. Remember, everybody in Africa who cannot be called an African is either an invader or a descendant of an invader. When militarily Africans clean house, it's going to have to include the pseudo-whites as well as the whites. And you don't have to have the Arab in order to have Islam, because the Arab is the most corrupt element within Islam. Two Africans helped to make the faith, two Ethiopians. Zaid bin Harith, Ibn Ribit Bilal. In Ethiopia protected this faith when it was about to be driven out of Arabia. And the Prophet Muhammad told his followers, go to Ethiopia. Go to that land of righteousness where no one is wrong. And he said on his deathbed, Islam will never forsake Ethiopia when Ethiopia is in distress. No nation in Africa has suffered more then and now at the hands of Islam than Ethiopia. Only a few years ago, the Muslims coming down from the north to destroy the previous Ethiopian government African Muslims, blacks, were capturing pretty Ethiopian women and turning them over to Arab dogs. Now, if you demean yourself in the name of a religion, then it is not a religion. All religions are good when they are used for good purposes. All of them are bad when they are used to spread hate and to enslave people. What you do not understand is nearly all organized religions are male chauvinist murder cults. They not only took the woman out of the center of religion where, where religion started, the African had no problem with the female God and had many of them. He assigned the goddess Nu the job of taking down the sun and putting it in her vagina overnight and taking it out and putting it up in the morning. Now, if you give a woman that assignment to make day and night, that means you are not afraid of her and that you must trust her because she can fail and the whole world will be in darkness. Now, this is symbolically speaking, but even symbolically speaking, look at the beauty of the symbol. Look at the trust. And at what point did we begin to put women in the background? Who said, women, you too bossy? We grew up in a society where women had a central place, and they could go as far as their mind could take them without making any man feel insecure. The European man is insecure with women. He made us feel insecure. In every one of our churches, in every one of our lodges, in every one of our organizations, there is one woman we call Big Mama, even as she only weighs 100 pounds, because <laughs> she's the boss. She keeps things together. 
in the Baptist church, they, if the women leave, they have to close their doors. The pastor won't get his annual suit. <laughs> money for his vacation. Money for his car. All this is maneuvered by women. And whether the deacons vote for a new minister or not, he dare not vote without consulting his wife. So the women are ruling behind the scenes because you've been hanging out with too many white people who are afraid of women. You think she's taking away our manhood. She is buying us the time to be better men. Look at it that way. She don't want you to be a wimp. This is why she's, taking, she's been taking care of so many things to free you to develop as a man. We have misinterpreted this because we listen to some other drama of another culture. Now I said there were three golden ages in Africa. And now let's deal briefly with that third one then come briefly to the United States. That third golden age began to start when the Africans and the Arabs drove the Romans out of Africa and the Europeans had to go back into Europe where they created what they call the Dark Ages. Europe never flourishes until they have people outside of Europe that they can exploit. Free labor, free land, free resources. They're looking for it again to recover from all the stupid walls that they fasten on this world. In inner Western Africa, nations began to develop. Ghana, Mali, Sangay. Sangay was as large as the United States ruled by Africans. Ghana was ruled by sacred kings. The last of their kings was Ten Kamenin, known as the king who rode out twice a day, every day. He would ride out and administer justice to his people, the whole court. No one was obliged to remove themselves from his presence until they were satisfied that justice had been done in their case. This was royal democracy at its best. Democracy did not begin to decline until someone began to use the word. Christianity did not begin to deteriorate until someone began to use the word. Someone began to formulize it and dogmatize it around a personality called Jesus Christ. But St. Augustine, looking at the conference at Nicaea, when the, European, when the Europeans made the religion European and a handmaiden for their conquest, he said, these people make me laugh. They're trying to give us a religion we had 3,000 years ago, which indeed we did. But we didn't call it by no name. We just practiced it. We didn't say, I am my brother's keeper. Because if you got to say it, I'm afraid you don't mean it. Just keep it. And don't talk about it. We produce societies so well governed by custom that we did not need civil law as you know civil law. Once the foreigners came in, they convinced us of a tragedy that we are still suffering from. They laughed at our gods and told you God can't possibly look like you. And when you bought that, you were in a trap and you're still in that trap. It is hard for you to imagine God looking anything like Michelangelo's painting who painted it 1,500 years after the death of Christ. Now, how can the hell did Michelangelo, who also had a, had a problem, knew how Christ knew it?
One of his relatives was the model for Christ. Another relative was the model for Moses. How did he know that Moses had a beard? And yet you don't ask him a question. He painted the Last Supper, and he got one artist, one model. Then he needed 12 more models. He was a little short of money. So where did he get the models from? Some men who wasn't doing anything from the local jail. So he dressed them up and painted them. And you so dewy-eyed, well, that's Peter, that's Paul. <laughs> That's a bunch of dressed up jailbirds. <laughs> and you find the picture without asking any question. Now you need to read Dr. Ben's work, The African Origins of the Three Major Western Religions. John Jackson is still alive. One of his last big books was Christianity Before Christ. He also did a book, Pagan Origins of the Christ Myth, dealing with the pictures of Christ in all kinds of society. Now let's go with this third golden age, which began to end concurrent with the rise of the slave trade. This great nation, Sungay, existed inland. It had great universities, University City, Genie, it had a great university at Timbuktu, so well organized the Arabs did not or could not teach at Timbuktu at the University of St. Cory. They wasn't brilliant enough. The great teachers had to teach 10 subjects well. The last of the great chancellors was Ahmed Barber, an African who had written 47 books, each on a separate subject, and he had never gone to any place for education outside of inner West Africa. Now, you, people tell you that the slave trade happened, but they don't tell you what else was happening. The great independent states in West Africa was flourishing, and they would not fall until 150 years after the slave trade had started. The great city-states of East Africa were flourishing until the Arabs forced the slave trade on that part of Africa using their mulatto offsprings in relationship with cooperation with the Portuguese. The Arabs were in the slave trade before Islam. And many brothers who tried to purify the Arabs by saying Islam is the black man's true religion, inasmuch as all the elements that went into the making of all religions came out of Africa, then all religions are the black man's true religion. And any time you use one religion to put one people against another people, you're making the wrong use of religion. You're making God ungodly. Every major religion of the world have used that religion to enslave other people. What I'm saying is now, after the Crusades, another faker in history that I don't have time to explain, because if you think it has something to do with religion, then you are misguided. It was a raping party. They raided everything in sight. Not only took the farmer's proud, took the farmer's daughter. They were so-called rescuing the Holy Grail, the one lost in the first place, one holy in the second place. <laughs> but they had drained Europe of so much energy that Europe went into a period of famine and plagues. And one of the main reasons for the famines and plagues was the lack of sanitation. The Europeans had not used a simple substance commonly known as soap. 
they had not then began to use washable underwear that was introduced into Spain by the Africans in a basic culture. They had lost the concept of longitude and latitude. And once they regained this maritime skill, mostly from the Chinese, the leading maritime nation of that day, who had a thousand years relationship with Africans, they built the ships that launched the slave trade. And out of nowhere came a hustler, a liar, a murderer who discovered absolutely nothing known as Christopher Columbus. <laughs> if you want further explanation, and if you forgive the modesty, my last book is Christopher Columbus in the African Holocaust. Any black bookstore will get it. It's small, so it's cheap. <laughs> you can't get hurt. I'll, I'm always stopping in the middle of big books to do little books. I was doing three books dealing with the liberation movement outside of Africa. The big book, Notes for an African World Revolution, is one. The one that I'm finishing now, Condition Reflex, The Dilemma of the Africans Away from Home, is the second. And after that, I would do a book called Immigrants Against Their Will, The Africans and the Americans in the Caribbean Islands. We are the only immigrants who came with an invitation. The nature of the invitation will not be discussed here because the invitees brought ships and guns and chains. They were so good, so anxious to keep us in the boats, they chained us down. And when we arrived, no unemployment problem, plenty jobs, no pay. But what we did made America set in motion the modern scientific and technical age. Now stop your children from crouching and looking at skyscrapers as though God put them up there, put up from wealth stolen from us. We should start claiming them. <laughs> And those talking about reformation, putting a figure on it, forget about the figure. I take the whole treasury. You can keep the change. <laughs> the debt owed to us is that great. The impact of the Africans on what is called the new world not only transform two hemispheres in the island of the Pacific, created an economic system that permitted Europe to recover from the Middle Ages, from the money and the wealth spent and wasted in the Crusades, from the loss of population during famines. African labor had rescued Europe. What I'm saying is that without your labor, that been no new world, and that Africans all over those hemispheres in the Caribbean islands, where you have the clearest revolutionary heritage in revolts, because in the Caribbean islands, they did not break up the slaves quite so often. The slave master bought in large lots and kept the lots together. Therefore, maintaining some form of African culture continuity. In the United States, they acted as though it was a brokerage house. They bought in small lots and broke those up. Mama goes one way, Papa goes another way, Uncle goes another way. So they fragmented <coughs> the slaves in the United States until they almost became strangers to each other. 
and the slave in the house became the enemy of the slave in the field. When in the Caribbean island, the slave in the house became the messenger and the informer for the slave in the field. Their revolutions were more successful because the line between these two slaves wasn't broken. It has nothing to do with whether Caribbean people are braver than any other people. They were the fortunate beneficiaries of a circumstance in history over which they had no control. But in the middle of the 19th century, they began to forget all of this. And early in the 20th century, they became black English, black French, black Dutch. And you go, they became almost the least African of all the African people. They would tell you about their Dutch grandfather, the English uncle, everything except Africa. We had to remember it because it was taken away from us so cruelly. What in the final analysis am I asking you to do? I'm saying forget all the difference in this division brought on us by conquerors and realize that we need to stop talking about whether slave ships put us down and concentrate on where the slave ships took us from. All of us came from Africa. Some were put down on an island called Barbados. They became Barbadian. On an island called Jamaica, they become Jamaicans. The slave ship brought no Jamaicans, brought no Barbadians, brought no high yellows, no low yellows. Brought no Deltas, no AKAs, <laughs> no Elks. All of these are artificial formations that you entered into in order to survive for the slave master put you down. I'm asking you to cast off these artificial formations if you cannot convert them into instruments of your liberation. I'm asking you to enter every institution, church or otherwise, that cannot be converted into an instrument of your liberation to be placed into the ash can of history. Everything that takes your time must serve you and support you. The church is too quiet and too dark, too many days. It should never be a weekend affair. There'll be days when you do nothing but just tutor children. There should not be a sick person on the block unattended to. There shouldn't be an old person on the block that's not safe. Because if you go back to society that produced you, everybody protected everybody. The least of all, old people that were considered deities because we were into, in part, ancestor worship. And we knew that the old people would go on before, and they could say a good word to the gods to make it nice for you when you get there. So you pampered them. We cannot reconstitute all old societies we can take the spirit of former societies we produce and live by that spirit. That means we must build the family again as a unit, relate the family to the total community, trust each other again, feel safe among each other again, love each other again. Stop ever referring to each other with derogatory words. Stop accepting the word minority. Realize that within Africa, in the millions of Africans in Asia, in the South Sea Islands, we number a billion people on the face of this earth. We are consumers of so much and producers of so little. Now, if we began to produce the clothes we wear, the food we eat, 
build the houses we live in. And if you live in a brick house, you should own a brick yard. And you should start with your underwear. People are tired of me reminding them of this, but I maintain crudely a people who cannot make their draws cannot rule a nation. <laughs> Let's start this. And let us remember when Dons were young and history was barely an embryo in the Nile Valleys of Egypt, in the Niger Valleys of other parts of Africa, Limpopo and the Zimbazi, we created the laws and the social thought that would later govern man who dared to call himself civilized after they had learned from us. The Greeks and the Romans warmed their intellectual hands on the fires that we had created. And except for what Africans had created earlier, there had been no Rome and no Greece. There was a time you stood at the center of the world. And if you're going to do it again, you have to train your children that they are capable of doing everything necessary to maintain a nation. Don't shout nation time until you are ready to maintain a nation. Don't shout black power until you know the responsibilities of power. Being black and beautiful means very little unless ultimately you are black and powerful. Realize there was a period of sovereignty and independence in your history when you were the major influences of the world and gave guidance to the world without oppressing anyone, without being arrogant enough to take anyone's country. And you gave the world some safety and a new humanity. Once you recover your confidence, read your history properly, train your children to remember these things and build them again. You can say, we are capable of starting a revolution that will change the world. We need each one of us a partner in this revolution. So I suggest that you find a mirror and don't move from the mirror until you lack what is staring back at you. <laughs> if you don't love yourself, the love you have for other people is worthless. What you need to do if you are serious, if you are in doubt, you will say, I will start my revolution to change the world tomorrow. But if you are serious and confident about it, you will say, the revolution to change the world starts with me, and it starts right now. Thank you. Dr. John Henry Clark. That's, that's powerful, Doc.
Ladies and gentlemen, we're going to have a question and answer period. I ask anyone who has any questions to ask Dr. Clark, please do so by lining up behind the microphone here and limit yourself to one question per person, please, so we don't wear out our elder. I'd like to also take this time to remind those who are here that Friday, March 26th, that's next Friday, uh, God. My question is going to be about um, the black middle class arising in South Africa. Could you make a comment? Well, middle classes are generally fakes and apologists for power. And they are the buffer that stands between the powerful and the lower class. You do not need a middle class, you need a responsible class. You need a technical elite. You need people who make sure that things are done. They are trying to create a middle class people. They will pamper them and they will become apologists for the continuation of white rule. I am saying this move is dangerous, watch it. Dr. Clark. Yes, sir. Why did you decide to be a historian? I decided to be a historian because I learned to read very early because I wanted to teach Sunday school in a Baptist church. They told me the Bible was God's book, and I couldn't find anybody in God's book and in Sunday school lesson that looked like me. They told me God was kind and God was merciful. Then I looked at all those white angels. Then I was faced with a contradiction. If God is kind and God is merciful, they didn't, he didn't let one little brown or black angel sneak into heaven. Then when I began to look at the images, look at Moses born in Africa. He became white. He goes down to marry his first of his three different Ethiopian women. Zipporah gets white. I pe see people going to the land of Kush, present-day Sudan, where you got some blue black people today. So they must have been even black out then. Go to the land of Punt, or Punet, now Somalia. And they got white. I began to suspect that someone had tampered with the Bible it had tampered with history itself. I began to search for the true history of my own people and the true history of the world. I made After reading Arthur Schomburg's work, The Negro Digs Up His Past, I knew that I came from a people who were older than Europe, older than oppression, older than slavery. I was well on my way to a profession of teaching. I had to do a whole lot of things before I got there, shine a whole lot of shoes, mop a whole lot of floors, sh clean a whole lot of dishes. But I finally got there. And for the last 40 years of my life, give or take, I've been teaching. <clears throat> Dr. Clark, I am a teacher at one of the local uh, Brooklyn public high schools, and uh, first of all, I'd like to thank you for coming out tonight and lecturing to us, and this has been the most inspiring lecture I've heard since I graduated from Hampton Institute uh, almost 20 years ago. But um, it, I think we can really appreciate what you've told us, and a lot of us needed to hear these things, uh, especially the young children here and some young adults. Uh, my question to you is for you to comment on the recent wave of world terrorism, and especially the terrorist activities we have experienced here recently in the U.S. Do you think that this is 
uh, a way of the third world to reach out to gain a new world order, uh, the hell not nations to get back on top. Would you comment on that for me, please? Well, black nations don't have to be on top, but they have to be sovereign. They must be masters of themselves. They don't have to be top of anybody except their own destiny. We are the only people who can come to power and exercise it without threatening other people's power. I think the terrorism that you are talking about, most of it is unrelated to African people. And I have serious question about what you call third world because I'm not too clear what's the first world and what's the second. I, 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 I don't accept categories that make me less than number one. I agree with you there, but that is the term that's being commonly used by media today. Quote, unquote, third world for countries such as Iran, well, Syria. Well, people call third world, some of them are pseudo white people, and some of them, once coming to power, will be just as ruthless to us as white people, and have already proven that. All right. Okay. Uh, one, now, one other. Let us hope that we can find an alliance with them, and some of them will come to their senses. But don't bet on it. Always have enough strength to maintain yourself in case they turn on you. Thank you. You'll you finish your question. Uh, you well, one thing I, I, I think a lot of us might be concerned with here now is the fear of what might happen in this country if there are more attacks on uh, places of uh, employment where a lot of people are gathered. I think that's the concern that needs to be... Well, well so far... I, we I'd like not, to hear your feelings on it. So far, we are not involved in that. There's nothing to prove our involvement in the tower bombing. and We're not involved in this kind of action because this is not exactly the way we pursue our liberation. And the people involved assumed or thought they were part of the same people they are bombing. But a, a different uh, uh, division. Thank you. Now, what is at hand really is a repercussion of something we don't mention because we get called anti something. But once a European, once a group of Europeans carved out a country that never belonged to them and began to evacuate people, they created some schisms in the world that a lot of people are glossing over without dealing with. And this angered a whole lot of people who began to lose their cool. Now, bumming house, homes and offices just not having to be our style of fighting. But it's the way some people are expressing themselves who wasn't heard otherwise. I'm not dealing with the rightness and the wrongness of it. I think if you're fighting for one cause, I don't see why you need to endanger a whole lot of people who wasn't the cause of your trouble. I'm against riots because most of them are unstrategic, most of them are sloppy, and most of them are a waste of time, and most of them destroy our communities instead of the communities of the people who oppress us. Yeah. Good evening, Honorable Dr. Clark. Uh, I'd like you to please um, expound on the role of the media and in this country and how it exploits African Americans and how and what ways in which African Americans can, what things they can do to uh, not buy into this and educate themselves whereby they are not exploited and not, and, uh, not caught up with even su uh, supporting uh, newspapers that exploit them. The media is an aspect of power and mind control. 
If you forgive the modesty, I have a chapter in my big book, African Notes for an African World Revolution, called Media and Mind Control. I look on the Bible, I look on magazines, all is a form of media and mind control. The movies, another form of mind control in the media. When you see so many white heroes, you assume you haven't never had a hero. When you see the white man always getting the girl, you assume that you can't get the girl. You may not be old enough to remember a series that Bill Crosby appeared in called I Spy. Remember the white man was always knocking over blondes and when Bill got a black girl, he lost her. Now you know damn well <laughs> we invented a kind of approach that is sometimes irresistible. Thank you, sir. There is in our folklore ceremony. We are ceremonious people. And so in courtships, and some of this has been unfortunate laws, when you approach a girl, she will say, what is your story? She wants ceremony. Tell her something, even if it's a lie. <laughs> Tell her something good. And so, knowing this, we get a story ready that will turn her head properly. <laughs> We're not cruel. We don't be snatched and say, come here, girl. That's new. People who think they possess women to the point they can't go through the ceremony. If you don't go through the ceremony, you don't deserve the favor. We have to go back to some of the nice things that existed in our life, including the father interviewing the suitor. And on the third visit, saying to him, what is your intention toward my daughter? And if your answer is not good, you go out of the door, and she can cry all she wants to, but you don't come there again unless you satisfy Papa. We need the Papas to stand at the door again. <laughs> to look the suitors over again and see if he's suitable to face our Supreme Court. I had a great grandmother and one of the girls in our family fell so in love some slick haired dude called Willie <laughs> and she brought him home she knew if grandmama Mary don't turn him down he's out grandma she said mama grandma I'm going to die if I can't marry Willie and grandma looked him up and down pulled her away and closed the door and she said girl Get rid of that <laughs> Get rid of that crazy thing. <laughs> and keep your dress tail down. That's the end. That was the end of the situation. She didn't die. Will it disappear? Later on, she married a decent guy, had three children, lived happily ever after. Young people don't know what they're doing half of the time. But we remember, we, we came out of societies where old people appraised the respective husband. And the uncles looked over the respective husband and interviewed him in depth. Then he had to petition this family to tell what, what an honor it would be to join such an illustrious family. Then if his petition was accepted, they approved. And both sides got together 
and put the diary together. It wasn't no bride price. It was a form of security for both of them. It was a cow raising people. They get 30 cows when, from each side of the family. So they start their herd with 60 cows. Might sound crude to you, but do you have one cow? <laughs> Maybe we need to go back to some of the old days and some of the old ways. Good evening, Dr. Clark. Good evening. Uh, there's been some discussion, and I have an article uh, that was written by the New York Times sometimes in the middle of uh, last year about certain African nations that were supposed to be coming together to do a study on the state of the African yesterday and today. Uh, number one, I want to know, is it true? And whether or not uh, some African Americans here in this country, were they involved in this study? And what uh, the status of the study The study is, of know? what now? There was supposed to have been a st uh, some African nation was supposed to come together to do a study on the, the, the true origin of slavery and how it affected the, the Americans here in this country. That was, and the, the talk was superficial. I wish it were done mm -hmm. because the true origin of slavery was in the mind of the Europeans who enslaved each other for a thousand years before they started on the Africans. And the Africans need to admit the role they played in the slave trade because all Africans are not guiltless. And some of us were turned over to the slave catcher by other Africans who became corrupt. Not all of us, but some of us. So I think we need to be honest with each other about the role of the African in Africa, what role he play, and what he will do to make some kind of amends in putting all of us back together as one people. Good evening, Dr. Clark. <clears throat> I really would like you to tell me what's the best way to handle an African American that gets in the way of the liberation of African Americans. I believe in this unity, and I'd love to love all of them, <coughs> embrace them. Please tell me how to do it strategically. Put space between you. <laughs> Don't try to reform him, give him the information, hope that he will use it. If he don't use it, then don't waste time letting him obstruct the movement. People who don't believe in themselves can't believe in you and can't help you. It's heartbreaking to know that there are some of us we have to write off so that the, uh, the rest of us can survive. Good evening, um, Dr. Clark. I want to ask you, um, what comments do you have to make on the exploitation of black women in the music business and in Hollywood? What information? What comments do you have to make on the exploitation of black women in the music business and in Hollywood? The black woman is horribly exploited in the music business and in Hollywood. And in the music business, she's partly, mainly exploited by whites, but partly exploited by black men. This is no excuse. I think uh, the rappers, many of them, are terrible exploiters of women. <laughs> and the things they use, the words they use, are not only exploitation, it is an insult. I think Hollywood has always not only exploited, but misunderstood the normal relationships between black men and black women, and a whole lot of black men have helped them misunderstand that by imitating white men and their misconduct toward their women. This is a major crisis, and what she has said is absolutely serious. Because if you can't respect one half of your humanity, which is your women, relating to your mother, then you're only one half of a human being. This is serious. I'm, the last question is the most serious question. If we can't relate to ourselves, 
we won't have we'd have a difficult time relating to to other people i think black men should have enough courage to take on and to deal with any man low enough to call a woman a bitch. Hotep, Honorable Dr. Clark. Indeed, tonight it is a pleasure for me to be here to listen to you. Briefly, I've heard you on several occasions speaking in what I have known to be, call them, identify them as sound in it. And religion is not supposed to make you arrogant. It's supposed to make you brotherly. Not supposed to pit you against your people, but give you a greater understanding of your people. Islam was the handmaiden of the Arab slave trade that existed a thousand years before the European slave trade. People are being killed in Africa right now because they are not Muslims. If you are a Muslim, then you must, why have you not confronted this fact? If we must deal with Christianity and its crimes, against African people, the crimes of Islam against African people are equally as bad. Why can't you confront that? Have it if you want, if you want this as your spiritual leadership. All religions are good if good uses are made of them. Personally, I hold all organized religions in suspicion because all of them have been used to justify the enslavement of a people, including Islam. Good evening, Doctor. I would like you to respond to the situation, the failure, as I see it, of the public school systems as far as aiding our youth. And what do you have to say about uh, maybe a, an approach to that particular problem? The public school system is not an educational institution. You must distinguish between education and training. You can train a dog, you can train a seal, but once the dog learns how to think, he will bite you and get away. But if you train him to jump through loops, he will jump through loops when you tell him to jump through loops. Education in New York City and most of this country is a multi-million dollar industry. It is about the control of that industry and the control of the mind of people who enter that industry. How can you expect powerful people to give you the training, give you the education that will make you take their power away from them? So therefore, education for you in the public school is a contradiction in turn, because if you were educated, you'd be the masters of yourself instead of falling behind someone else to lead you, you would lead yourself. Good evening, Dr. Clark. I have a question in regard to your book, African World Revolution, and the, the cha um, concerning the chapter, Can the Africans Save Themselves? Yes. Could you please expound Last on that? Time. Well, that chapter was written before others in the book. And when I said, can Africans save themselves, when I read the question, I mean, can we stop being dependent on other people for our bread, our house, 
our jobs. If we are a billion people on the face of the earth, we can employ at least two-thirds of the African people in the world furnishing goods and services for each other. We should master the gold and the diamonds, the resources of Africa, put this together with the resources of the Caribbean Sea, put this together with the technical knowledge of the black American, who's the best technically trained African in the world, put all of this together and we must save ourselves from domination and dependence on other people and become the masters of ourselves. I raise the question, can we do it? And if we fail to do it, we might as well be contented to be dependent because a dependent people are slaves, no matter what name you call it. If you depend on another people for your bread, your house, your resource, your salary, and created nothing that gives you some form of independence, then you have programmed yourself into slavery. And slavery is a form of dependency on other people. Last question. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, I thank you for coming out and hearing the lecture of Dr. John Henry Clark. Uh, I repeat, next Friday, March 26, at PS 243, that's 1580 Dean Street, the corner of Troy Avenue, there will be a free slide presentation of the African people globally. And in the future, uh, sometime of May, we expect to bring in Dr. John Henry Clark. Um, Excuse me, Dr. Leonard Jeffries. Ladies and gentlemen, for those of you who are interested in purchasing a video of this evening's event or our, our first cultural lecture uh, series, which was pertaining to Dr. Yosef Ben Yakinen, you can come up front and purchase it from Transatlantic Productions, or if you were interested in purchasing the audio video, and excuse me, in the back of the auditorium, if, if you're interested in purchasing an audio uh, tape, you can come up front and purchase that um, now if, you, if you're interested. And also, we have the, this Hashi video production who we'll also videotape this event for future uh, purchases of any tape. You may also contact them who are also in the front of the auditorium. I thank you and ask that you all get home safe. Have a good evening. Wake up a